Tansi Mio Pone Pita Gisigao. Uh, hello uh, and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sakawis, also Christine Nobis, and I'm Plains Cree Salto of the George Gordon uh, First Nation and a decolonizer with Great Plains Action Society. And I'm very honored today to be um, introducing Alexis Bunton and Nick Estes uh, along uh, with myself uh, for a fireside chat. Uh, concerning um, colonial capitalism and uh, a pathway uh, towards a better future. Uh, Alexis, welcome. Thank you, Christine. So I'm going to spend about the next couple of minutes talking about how Indigenous peoples are leading us out of the mess that capitalism is right now. But I wanna start by establishing my authority on this subject. Again, like Christine said, my name is Alexis Bunton. And my authority starts from being born as an Alaska Native woman. My tribes are Anangan and Yupik from Bristol Bay, Alaska. And I've worked for tribal businesses, corporation, Native corporations, consulted for them, wrote a PhD on the subject. I've taught economics <laughs> and I currently co-direct the Indigeneity program for Bioneers and serve as a senior advisor with JumpScale. So right now what we're seeing is indigenous led organizations are making the greatest innovations while proving ROI, while redefining impact to include nature, ecosystems and ethics. So just a few examples of these is BCG Crypto is using blockchain technology um, Right now, uh, one of the tribes they're working with is one of the first to be approved by the SEC to develop and register a security in the US. And one of the things that they've worked into uh, trading through the blockchain is making sure that nature has a place at the table and that nature is a shareholder in um, their, uh, the way that they use blockchains. Yigo Coffee has completely indigenized their supply chain, um, which gives more returns back to the people who roast the coffee. Labukan Solar has built renewable energy in the middle of the tar sands while providing employment and fighting climate change. Hope Nation Consulting focuses on women's leadership and while they do their business consulting, they're also addressing underlying uh, co colonial uh, genocidal trauma and you cannot do one without the other. And my own native corporation, Bristol Bay Native Corporation is dedicated to the fishing way of life first fish first, and we have consistently led the fight against Pebble Mine, which is back on the table now, which would be the largest open pit, uh, open pit copper mine in, in, the, in the continent. And, and we're still, we're opposing that mining, but we are still having record return year after year. So uh, I wanna say, First of all, I want to dispel our audience of the idea that indigenous peoples can't be capitalists, that we can't be business leaders, and that we can't be extremely successful, and the innovators that everybody else looks to for new ways out of this mess that I started with. So um, I argue that we can be, but it's more of an indigenous capitalism. And if you want to learn more about that, you can read the 2011 article I wrote on this called Indigenous Capitalisms. And I want to define for a minute what colonial capitalism is, because this is in the title of this talk, of this fireside chat today. And I would say it's part and parcel of this larger definition of capitalism. Colonialism and capitalism are essentially the same thing. And we can use the US as an example of this. So for example, it requires colonization, which if you don't know the definition, it's basically when a group of people take land by force from another group to permanently live there and control resources. And that force in America means genocide that's ongoing now. It involves privatization. It involves the establishment of needy groups of people. If any of you are economic theorists, um, talking about dependency theory, uh, having a, a, an underclass or people that you permanently make poor, or um, here we use racism, of course, and structural inequality. It requires partnership with the nation state to make and enforce laws that protect privatization, exploitation, natural resource extraction, and intergenerational concentration of capital. It requires resources taken from stolen land, and it requires perpetual warfare. And uh, one interesting fact about the United States is since, our, since the country's inception in 1776, we've been at war for 225 of the 240 years this nation has been around. So, um, 
some scholars talk about post-capitalism or late stages of capitalism. Um, I, I don't know if capitalism is going to go away. It probably will. Marx certainly thought it would, and a lot, many of our indigenous leaders um, and uh, culture bearers believe it will. I've been told that my whole life. But while we are still in this system and transitioning out of it to a more regenerative world, um, our indigenous-led businesses um, are, are, are really practicing this sort of indigenous capitalism. And I'll just take about 60 more seconds here. One of the features of this indigenous capitalism, this new way out is to incorporate indigenous worldviews and values into your business ethos, thoughts, mission, and practice, and to keep checking it. So some values may include respect, um, reciprocity, giving back, and relationship, honoring relationship first. So how non-native organizations can get this can get what we what we are leading the way in is just if I just want to leave you with a few practical tips. One uh, might be re re revise your mission to make it truly values driven first. Get indigenous people on the board or at least diversify your board to 50% or more. Put nature on the board. Hire indigenous consultants. Decolonize your organizational practices. This thing that I call organizational or institutional decolonization. Um, this is something that I've been working on for the last few years and I've um, already done it with an organization to, to great results. Decolonize your wealth. Check out Edgar Villanueva's book called Decolonizing Wealth. Some ways to do that, divest all your business uh, activity from fossil fuels in all ways, including the banks you use like Wells Fargo. Invest in portfolios that consider a quadruple bottom line not just people, planet, and profit, but also spirit or well-being. So adopt, learn about and adopt this quadruple bottom line. Um, so I'm going to stop there. I think I've taken up enough time and cue it up for Nick. Uh, that's a traditional Lakota greeting um, that says, I greet everyone with a handshake and an open heart. Uh, and I'm happy to be here. This is a little bit out of uh, my own comfort zone and as far as uh, talking about these kinds of things. But nonetheless, I think it's uh, an important perspective that I'm going to try to offer. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about our organization, the Red Nation, and some of the projects we're working on. We were founded in 2014. Uh, we have over 100 different members um, from different indigenous nations, so we're, multi, we're multinational in that sense, um, that are even outside of the United States. We're anti-capitalist and anti-colonial. Uh, we're also connected with many different uh, global indigenous organizations. Some of them have kind of formal recognition at the United Nations, other are more social movement based, uh, especially in Latin America, like places like Bolivia, uh, Brazil, uh, Ecuador, and, um, and Venezuela. Um, but we also center, you know, uh, direct action and mobilization in education as part of our primary, um, primary kind of orientation towards our politics. And we're, we were at first based out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, and we saw this kind of growing need amongst indigenous people in the city to uh, access to housing and access to uh, healthcare specifically, uh, but also to combat police violence. And that's really where we were founded and where we do a lot of our work with it within our community here. Um, and since then we've expanded. So today, um, you know, today I just got a call and and this is going to be a week from now, but today I got a call about um, a tent city occupation that was set up by indigenous people in Hesapa, uh, the Black Hills, um, but, and we have comrades and relatives there from Red Nation who are on the ground and helping organize with that. So we have quite a, an extensive reach. Um, we have been doing uh, what we call the No Dead Natives campaign, which is hashtag NDN, uh, since 2015 um, to combat um, exposure deaths in border towns, uh, specifically the white dominated settlements that ring Indian reservations that basically exploit indigenous life. Uh, we started in Gallup, New Mexico, which has the highest percentage of indigenous people uh, per capita for a, a, an urban population. They're almost half of the population, have zero representation in the city, uh, but nonetheless feed the, 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 the city's economy, whether it's through Walmart payday loan, uh, payday loan lending or through uh, any kinds of things such as car dealerships and things like that. Um, we're currently working uh, on a land back campaign here in the city. 
thinking uh, about in indigenous spaces in the city as part of uh, indigenous territories and never have having been formally ceded. And so what, how, what we've been doing without a lot of uh, capital investment, but just based on our own membership dues and volunteer uh, um, uh, labor that we've uh, kind of cobbled together and organized is we've created a food sovereignty program to uh, reconnect indigenous youth with the land uh, and with traditional foods. And that goes into our outreach campaign. Every week we feed uh, relatives who are on the street, low-income relatives. It doesn't matter by relative, we mean indigenous and non-indigenous people um, who may be in need. And we've expanded those services in uh, the time of COVID because in a place like New Mexico, um, New Mexico has the highest rate of childhood hunger, right? And so we're combating that, not just by giving out canned food or starchy foods or unhealthy foods, but trying to reconnect people with indigenous foods and saying like, look, this is a viable altern alternative that you can grow right here in the city. Uh, and our final thing that we're working on um, is uh, red media. So uh, we actually formed the Red Nation as a media um, outlet and a media collective, uh, but we turned into a movement instead, which is actually much more beneficial. So we were you know, a movement before we became a media project, but we have four principles. The first is indigenousness is a way of relating, which means that transcends uh, the, the kind of confines of the nation state, uh, especially uh, settler colonialism. Uh, we have another one that says by any media necessary we do media like formal journalism podcasting but also we do a lot of infographics uh, with our social media campaigns the third principle is that we are not a minority oftentimes indigenous people get uh, cast as a minority within a larger you know settler system uh, but we are the majority of this of this hemisphere and so we have to behave and act like that right uh, and then the fourth principle is kill the capitalist in your head and what we mean by that is that we're not here to make a profit. We're not here to sell um, our writing or our products as something that can be bought and consumed. Um, we believe in producing confidence uh, through the stories and through the media that we produce and through our direct action campaigns that things can and, and will change uh, if we are organized, not just as indigenous nations, but non-indigenous people as well. And so we believe decolonization is not only an indigenous problem, it's everybody's problem. And specifically on a global scale, the way that we're going with climate change, it's decolonization or extinction. I'll turn it over to Christine. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I should have said I was done. <laughs> That was great. Um, you got through a lot and in five minutes exactly. Um, thank you for uh, turning it over to me. Uh, it's nice to be back at SOCAP, um, this time um, a speaker uh, on a main stage. Um, I've actually spearheaded Indigenous at SOCAP uh, for two years in a row. So um, this has been a, a real uh, a passion of mine uh, because uh, also of my beliefs uh, in what colonial capitalism is and, and what, it, what it's doing uh, to our world. Um, um, as I said earlier, uh, I'm a decolonizer with Great Plains Action Society. Uh, we are indigenous folks of the Great Plains uh, working to resist and indigenize, um, resist uh, colonial capitalist institutions and indigenize the world. Um, and to start, I, I, I actually um, w referred back to a talk I, I did last year at Bioneers uh, today and, uh, and saw a quote that I, um, I, I stated uh, at that talk uh, by Piao Piao Mox Mox, who was a Walla Walla chief. Um, and he said, uh, goods and the earth are not equal. Goods are for using on the earth. You cannot give goods in exchange for land. Um, you know, the capitalist idea of exchanging lands uh, for goods was a completely foreign concept uh, to indigenous peoples before colonization and genocide uh, occurred on these lands. And, and so this quote is at the foundation of everything I do, uh, because um, I believe and I know um, that capitalism uh, is intrinsically linked, uh, tied to colonialism. They are one and the same, essentially, as uh, Alexis and Nick have just stated. So I don't really have to go into the details of that because you already did that for me. So thank you. Um, <laughs> so I don't ever use these terms separately. Um, I, 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 I always use them together. Um, um, and I would even add, uh, you know, Christianity in the, to that as well, um, which is actually the foundation of all of this. Um, but I'm here today to talk about 
uh, like philanthropy um, and about uh, where SOCAP is headed. And I know that one of the taglines of SOCAP is where uh, money meets uh, meaning. And I do know that last year, uh, one of the uh, original founders uh, gave a talk about that, that maybe perhaps the meaning of, of SOCAP uh, has, has, has um, uh, left uh, somewhat uh, the space. And, um, you know, I just, I, I want to talk about um, philanthropy rather than impact investing or like social capitalism right now, as I think these concepts, um, as they are actually practiced, are still just a form of capitalism that is still perpetuating colonialism. Because in the end, indigenous communities are still the first to be extracted from and the last to be resourced, um, regardless of whether or not people right now um, are um, trying uh, to uh, change um, how they do capitalism, because in the end, capitalism is still capitalism and still colonialism, in my in my opinion. Um, and, and this is, you know, because the, the green capitalist economy is fundamentally still flawed in its understanding of how profit should be understood, right? So like, what is profit? Um, how do we understand what profit, you know, is? What is the meaning of profit? Um, and and I think that no matter how you look at it, um, with capitalism, um, it's it's always you know a soul uh, soul entity gaining um, uh, gaining gaining uh, margins of of something. Um, so if we want to elevate indigenous ways of being in this world to combat colonial capitalism, there needs to be a reckoning with the fact that money, um, profit, if you will, um, in the in the investment world, in the political world, and in the uh, philanthropical world, still uh, cycles uh, in white privileged circles. Um, so, like the majority of uh, philanthropic funding right now goes primarily to white-led organizations, uh, which of course is still perpetuating injustice. Um, there was a, a study done by the First Nations Development Institute between 2006 and 2014, um, where they they found that the total share of all foundation funds going towards uh, Native American-led organizations and Native American causes was only 0.6% of the total. Um, and like, so in other words, uh, there's another study that was done uh, by St uh, Stanford Social Innovation Review um, where they they saw that like out of like 99, out of the $60 billion um, in US foundation, foundation funding each year, um, 95% of it goes to white-led organizations. So this is happening uh, in the, the the philanthropical world, where in fact it should be the opposite, right? To um, uh, like what's happening uh, in in the um, impact investing impact investing world, for instance, right? So um, this goes to show you um, that this is you know very much a. a I would say that this is a, a relevant statistic and that it would tell us that across the board uh, in the, you know, not just the philanthropical, but like in the political and in the uh, impact investing world, we probably still are having the same issues. Um, and, and this is important because at this particular moment, and just you know, before one of the most contentious presidential elections in U.S. history, um, this issue could not be more apparent, right? Because as um, Indigenous communities are facing COVID um, and all sorts of other issues, um, we are we are left like even more disenfranchised right now uh, at the polls uh, due to lack of funding uh, and a want to actually like uplift uh, people's voices and values, um, even in the political realm. And even though uh, we have grown, um, you know, 35% uh, uh, more uh, or 35% while well, the rest of the population has grown 14% from 2006 to 26, 2000 to 2016, uh, we're, we're not being seen still. Um, and so what I've said to um, some, I guess you would say heavy hitters in the political world is um, uh, uh, you all have to stop putting money towards the status quo. Um, you're still putting money towards, um, you know, white uh, populations that you think are going to get out the vote. Um, and, you know, right now there's only a handful of indigenous led uh, 501c4s in the country. Uh, Great Plains Action Society is one of them um, that can really make that precarious link between nonprofit community organizing and real political change, which is a difficult thing to do. So, um, I just want to say that um, we we need to to understand that in the end um, we are the idea of, of of social impact investing and um, 
is still, I think, uh, very much a capitalist endeavor. Um, and people need to start understanding that money needs to flow in a different direction first so that we can allow people to get to those levels where they can start creating uh, a better economy, um, an indigenous led regenerative economy uh, for uh, a better compassionate world. So that will be the end of my little spiel. Um, would anybody like to jump in and say anything? I have a lot to say. I mean, just listening to both of you talk, um, the wheels were kind of spinning in my head when you said, uh, Christine, that you know, 95% of this funding goes to white orgs. 95% of privately owned land in, in this country is owned by white people. Um, and if you think about South Africa under apartheid, you know, white people made between five to seven percent of the population, but owned seventy percent of the land. And so there's a direct translation between who owns the land, has the wealth. Uh, and then the other thing was that it's not just about voting. And I think this is what we're trying to do uh, with the Red Nation is you actually have to like if you look up, yeah, it's one of the most contentious uh, presidential elections in U.S. history, but it's also the one that has the least alternatives for a way out of this mess, right? And so part of this is like, we're actually trying to build an alternative. Uh, and I learned this from my friends in the global south that you can, yeah, you can go to the polls, but if you're not, if you don't know how to plant your own food, if you don't know how to grow your own food, then what are you really doing? Are you feeding people, you know? And so this is what we're actually, you know, we're trying to put into practice. I know both of you are trying to do this as well because we, we don't just see, um, you know, we're not just out here making demands, we're actually trying to build something, right? And that is part of that transition away from capitalism uh, to a more just and sustainable society. We can't we can't build if we're not if we don't have a voice as well. Mm -hmm. Alexis, well, I just wanted to uh, offer a couple takeaways from things that I heard both of you say. My snapping fingers are sore now. Thanks a lot. Um, but just some takeaways I have. I, we could probably do this for another hour. But um, my mine are. A, capitalism is insanity. We're killing ourselves and the planet and uh, the planet will survive. Our species won't. Capitalism is reliant on, another way it's insane is it's reliant on the red queen hypothesis, uh, which is constant growth. And if you've ever read Alice in Wonderland, those books through the looking glass, the red queen just keeps running and running and running and running to stay in the same place. That's crazy. Everyone needs to decolonize. All three of us hit on that. In, in multiple ways. Uh, I've really picked up on uh, Christine, you saying that indigenous peoples are the last to be resourced. And I'd also like to point out that capitalism is wholly dependent on exploitation, whether it be of natural resources or people. And I was just thinking the other day about how um, uh, indigenous peoples in the US were the first to be enslaved. But what many people don't know is that the Onangan people living on St. George and St. Paul Island in the Pribilofs in Alaska were enslaved, legally enslaved by the US government well into the 1960s. And that kind of information needs to be put out there. This is why we need that media voice. I also picked up on Christine saying, and Nick, saying how the green economy is still flawed. It is, it needs that quadruple bottom line and we do need to redefine impact. And, um, and finally, about philanthropy, oftentimes um, well-intentioned philanthropists who get really excited about indigeneity, they're only skimming the surface. They get really excited about, um, about spiritualism, really. And I think of them as spiritual tourists, but not actual movements. So um, I really want to encourage people to go to what's authentic and real, which is like the Great Plains Action Society and what Red Nation is doing. Yeah, and I think the bottom line is that um, colonial capitalism is the antithesis to uh, indigenous ideologies and methodologies, which is why indigenous folks around the world have been uh, genocided and colonized uh, because uh, you know the, um, the the colonizers could not have uh, this opposite ideology, um, you know, when they are taking land um, and, and, and the resources. And so um, we, we do need to absolutely uh, change our mindset. That is where we need to be. We need to change the mindset of the world in order to, in order to overcome this climate crisis or to combat it in any way whatsoever. I think, yeah, I think the other, just uh, a really quick uh, comment uh, to build off of that is that it's, 
you know, indigenous peoples uh, caretake uh, around a quarter of land-based environments, right? Uh, and with that, they're protecting air that we all need to breathe, whether it's through the forests or these carbon sinks, such in the, as the Great Plains. Um, but also, you know, uh, we, you know, indigenous people are then criminalized for protecting those landscapes, uh, including water, you know, with the Keystone XL gas or Keystone XL pipeline and things that they're trying to build through our territory, the Dakota Access Pipeline and the slew of legislation that they have uh, passed to criminalize us, right? It shows that we represent a real threat uh, because we actually represent a real alternative. Otherwise they wouldn't be investing so much money and be so well organized. And we have to be more organized, right? We're going against one of the largest, most destructive forces in history. Uh, and we have to be 10 times as organized and thinking not just about, oh, next year about our funding we have to be we have to be planning 50 years in advance and 100 years in advance and that's where we're at right now we're at the beginning stages of planning that so thank you so much uh nick and alexis and um i hope everybody out there uh understands more about decolonizing and uh combating uh, colonial capitalism um uh with indigenous uh, economies uh, and and politics uh and and ways of being in this world um i hi uh kitata mehen